So one brief thing I wanted to uh, mention, uh, fees. I mentioned right here the concept of fees. Well, here's the thing that there is always someone in the middle when it comes to money. So, except cash, I guess I should write here. Uh, but if we're going to be collecting payment online, if we're going to accept credit cards and debit cards, there's going to be someone in the middle because of the um, monetary transaction. So basically, credit card is entered and then held, money is held in, a, in an escrow account escrow account then transfer to your bank so in the middle that money has to be held somewhere you put your credit card information in if it's a credit card or a debit card different things happen uh, the credit card processor in the middle then determines there is enough funds yes or no that money gets transferred eventually gets settled in a few days and you have the money technically well, there's always someone in the middle then when it comes to transferring money. And usually that means there's also a fee, meaning there are fees. Uh, so authorize.net is going to charge you a percentage. PayPal is going to uh, uh, charge you a percentage. Stripe, all of these are going to offer you various amounts of percentages, uh, some of the more modern things like Venmo they don't charge you unless you reach a certain threshold and such but there's always going to be fees when you buy something at Target or Walmart or IKEA and you swipe a card uh, those companies are getting charged by Visa or MasterCard etc uh, and that's billions of dollars we don't see that as the consumer but IKEA and all of them they do that's why in some places they accept an American Express and not another place. Or some places they accept Discover and another place not. Because that place determined that the credit card processing fees were too much. So for us, that's also something to be aware of because yes, PayPal has some transaction fees and authorized.net and all of them have some amount. Uh, we have to look at the exact values, but it's usually something like 2.8% on PayPal. It's like 2.9% on Authorize. I'm just making up numbers. I have to look. I have to look them up. Um, yeah. It depends on, on yes, it depends on when it's happening, um, but um, depending on which account you've got set up, if you're paying, if you're getting, if you're collecting money and you're using the money in PayPal, there might not be any fees. But I need to get it out of PayPal to then pay my vendor. My vendor doesn't have, doesn't accept PayPal, perhaps. So somewhere around there, there's going to be some sort of fee. Um, like Venmo, that's a hot thing at the moment to uh, pay each other. Like, I'm going to pay my landlord that way. And you just swipe it or tap it or whatever. And tr those transactions might be free. But then when you want to get it out of your account, there may be fees there. Yeah. The PayPal fee takes care of that. So any uh, major credit card will be accepted or debit card, and that fee is universal. So there isn't the difference between which credit card. Yeah. Well, PayPal pays Visa or pays Mastercard. Yeah. Card yes. That is not Yes, to my knowledge, yep, uh, they don't add it on extra, although I believe it's, it is something more like uh, something percent plus 30 cents, something like that. So there's always at least a minimum of 30 cents you're going to be charged, something like that. So we'd have to look at their frequently asked questions screen. We can do that right now. Uh, PayPal fees.
online payments 2.9 plus 30 cents mobile in-store payments 2.7 with a swipe they're gonna charge you perhaps or not the customer Anytime a customer buys something from you, when the customer buys something from you and a credit card is used, uh, PayPal will be deducting 2.9% from what they bought off of your site. Um, uh, then, I, then I think there might be then also that extra uh, fee for taking it out of PayPal as well keeping it in PayPal then making you know if you have a balance in your PayPal and you have that linked when you want to make payments then there should be no fee on that so all the details I have to look them up exactly but the short answer is that there is someone in the middle there are fees check fees yourself to determine if they're worth it The best way around that, cash. But that has its own problems, right? And its own liabilities and such. Um, I've known uh, small businesses uh, that, uh, for example, in their business in the store, they use, let's say, Clover or Square or Stripe. There's just so many payment possibilities because going from an eight from a 0.1% difference might be big enough for what their store is. I see this all the time, which I'm sure that they're not doing it the right way, but for example, uh, I, uh, when, when I go to a certain uh, uh, barber shop, uh, they want to do the swipe, but they say, okay, we have to add, I have to add an extra whatever to it, 50 cents per swipe. Well, they're trying to recuperate what they're going to lose from PayPal charging them, but uh, technically, in terms of services, you're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to add on to what you're charging the customer what we're charging you. Uh, so there's ways to handle that. But check with your tax professional for the best answer. Yeah. Well, as another said, Venmo, because I was working with somebody two weeks ago, you don't really have it in reporting because it's not designed to be used for business. It's mm. personal. Mm. They thought it would get a really pretty detailed reporting. Yeah. In your, in your system. But Venmo, you're not that. No. Yeah, Venmo is much more person to person, so there isn't that much reporting. But PayPal, definitely. You can have a whole very powerful invoicing system uh, to keep track of all of that, all of those transactions. No. These things are not taxes, these are transaction fees. So no, PayPal doesn't take care of any taxes, that's still on you. So um, let's get back to these various other screens. This uh, definitely is, if you've got more questions, check with the tax professional especially one that deals with online commerce. Let's um, go to checkout. Users can check out without a user account or users must register before checking out. So you have those options. Can a person buy something anonymously and then decide to create an account? Or must they first create an account before buying a product? So that's up to you to decide which you like, which method you want. Dealing with shipping. Enable same as billing address checkbox or users must re-enter. This one's kind of weird that they have this default. Um, I would recommend to turn on enable this one. You've bought products that it says enter your shipping address, enter your billing address, and you can easily have one be copied to the other so you don't retype it. For some reason, the default here is the person must type both of those manually. I would recommend turn on the first one so that whatever they typed into their 
um, billing address, they can easily tra transfer it over to their shipping. And obviously, if the person needs to put a different shipping versus billing, they can do so. Here's the part. Security and encryption. Force users to use SSL or allow site to be used insecurely and unencrypted. That sounds terrible, so let me change it to SSL. Don't change it to SSL because you did not purchase an SSL certificate. It says, this can cause warnings for your users if you do not have this properly configured. Eventually, you will want to turn this on when you're on a live, real server and you've purchased and set up the SSL certificate. We have to leave this unencrypted at the moment. We're not on a real server. We have not purchased SSL from Bluehost. Therefore, this will not work. Once it's live, you should transfer it to here so you get the little lock in the address bar, just like I've got this lock in PayPal. This is a secure site. Check out form field. So there's a lot of little boxes, but they all should make sense. A person is going to buy a product, and we're going to ask for all this information, such as what is your first name, last name, address, and all of that. So pretty easy to work with here. You can grab them by the edge and move them to different orders that you want. I actually, actually don't want to ask for their uh, phone number, so I can deactivate it from display. Uh, I want to combine first name and last name into one field, so I can uh, turn off that one and just say full name. You don't have to do any of this, but if you want to tweak any of this, it should make sense. Um, right, you can move that around. If I want to also ask for the person's Twitter address, how do you think I might add a new field? Plus. Right there, plus. So wherever I click the plus below it, it will add a new field. And you can ask them a variety of extra things. So I can just for fun click plus. I'm going to ask them to type some text into this box. Text area is a larger box of text. Uh, is this a heading to divide up the design? Check boxes and so forth. Just do plain text and Twitter. You can say, what's your Twitter? Assuming they have a Twitter account. So you can make these different boxes, collect this information. This information will be stored on your site in your database. Notice there's nothing here about credit card information. That credit card info will be stored at PayPal. But any of this information that you're asking for, you could be liable for on your server if you get hacked. But at least not credit cards. We have a mandatory column. They have to fill in their Twitter or not. Show it or not, or delete it. Some of these basic ones cannot be deleted, but you can turn off display. I don't want to ask for city for some reason. Turn off display instead of deleting it. So Victor, you said you could be held liable if you're a mm -hmm. I mean, but we're hearing about these cases all the time, Target and Mm -hmm. Home Depot, Lowe's, etc. Experian, you know, TransUnion. I mean, I didn't receive a pen. <laughs> Not yet. The lawsuits are still pending. But uh, on the opposite side, uh, yeah, um, it is a it is a tricky thing. That's going back to the original question about: Are you sure you want to become the next Amazon? Because I have a product, I have the will, I have the time, I have the money to become an e-commerce merchant. But then I've also got to deal with security. And for a big multi-billion dollar company, Target, Experian, etc., they have an army of lawyers to help them through this. For us, I don't. We don't. So the best that we can do is SSL certificate, set up secure logins to the site, um, asking the minimal information necessary, um, investing in. There are also supposed security plugins that will help you set up a secure site even more. But really, it's going to be the SSL certificate. So a lot of times, people in the beginning say, oh, I don't want to pay an extra $99 a year. Well, that $99 could really help you in the long term for not getting hacked. Question? Um, could I wonder, like, say, a birthday thing or a Yeah, let's see here. Um, Select 
under select hmm there isn't one d built into birthday but you can sort of do it yourself here <clears throat> a couple of ways you can have them type it in as text or it looks like if you set it up to select you can make birth years but obviously I don't want to type in 50 years here so it doesn't seem to be like a very easy select the birth birthday T text area might be the closest text might might be the closest instead of labels yep you can say you know a general age uh, you know a 13 to 18 years old and then add another one uh, 20 to 29 years old no, it, it doesn't seem to be able to do that. Month and date, you'd have to do the same thing. Month and then add values, January, February. So it doesn't seem to have a, a built-in ability to s select birthdays easily. Mm -hmm. If you ask me for a phone number, um, can you give them an explanation as to why? Yes, what you can do uh, is you can add a new item, and then what you add here is a heading. And then whatever you type here, it's not something that they select. It's you type some text here that explains why we're asking for the phone number. So that's set as a heading. I'm going to save that. If you made any changes, you can save it. You don't have to save it. If you didn't make changes, that's checkout. Let's look at marketing. <clears throat> marketing tab. Users who bought this also bought. So we can turn on this option, uh, which is called cross-selling. If a person bought a certain product, the system will try to also recommend them to buy another product, another related product. Related products will happen via categories, which we'll get to next time. But this is a way to further uh, convince people to buy something more. It's going to be related. Now, there's also the concept of upselling, which is that uh, a person's about to buy something, a, a certain model of a product for $9.99. Upselling would be that the system says, why not buy this version for $15.99 and you get even more? WP Commerce doesn't, does not have a built-in upselling feature it has a cross selling in that related items could be um, given to the user but WooCommerce has upselling and other features where it can recommend you like this one you might like this better one over here for a little bit more you can turn this on or off if you want uh, whatever makes sense to you share this social bookmarks this is well uh, my product looks really cool I want people to promote it for me on their Facebook or Twitter that's what that's about uh, there are better plugins that activate social sharing so I wouldn't use this one it's a little too basic I'll mention social sharing plugins later but that's uh, free advertising how customers find us add this to a drop-down option at checkout would you like people to uh, select how they found you it's not editable, and I forget what the options are, but it'll say, did you find us via email, via a website, a blog? How did you find us? That information could be useful to you to figure out how your marketing efforts or social media efforts are, are panning out. Facebook like button is similar to the one up here. There's a better one, so I wouldn't use that one. And all of these other things don't worry about them but if you know about Google Analytics there's a spot for you to set that up so that one final one then we'll wrap up for the day and we'll look at the other ones next time import go to import so all of our products eventually when we add products they're gonna exist in your database so you might already have a product inventory elsewhere, like QuickBooks or something. Uh, instead of putting in our products one by one, as we will see next time, there is a way to import 
the database of products. Uh, you upload a certain file, CSV format. Now this is unfortunately the problem with shopping carts. Every shopping cart plugin, every shopping cart solution believes they have the best solution. Therefore, their shopping cart is usually not compatible with other shopping carts, the inventory system. And I've dealt with this in the real world from one client moving from one type of website to another. Well, all of the database can be distilled down to a simple CSV file, a comma separated values file. And it's going to look something like this. Uh, a database is going to say, okay, banana, comma, the yellow fruit, comma, contains potassium, comma, 67 cents, comma. Every entry in the database can be separated as one line like that. Uh, so we can import a database from elsewhere. But WP Commerce needs the fields to be in this order. Product name, description, additional description, price. SKU, number, weight, etc. And WooCommerce might need it in a different way, and Business Catalyst in another way, and Magento in another way. All of these solutions, they, they believe their order of columns and their number of columns is the right way. So when we dealt with this with a real client, um, we had to take their database of, of, of items and rearrange all of those columns to fit into what, we, what WP Commerce expects. So what I'm saying here is, for practice, we're starting with WP Commerce. And when we look at WooCommerce, you might decide, okay, I want to go with WooCommerce. Or when we look at WooCommerce, you might say, that's too complex, I want to stick with WP Commerce. What I'm getting at is, whatever database you're, you decide, I mean, whatever uh, e-commerce plugin you decide to keep, it might then be tricky to move from one to the other. But because this project is a test project, we're, we're learning it, it's not critical at the moment, you should be aware early on it would be difficult for move, to move from one plugin to the other once you start to put a lot of products. But if you'd like to tr do those imports and all of that, there is the way to do it. So just to put the note here. If you're going from one um, database to another and it's not in the right um, format, you're the right, um, order. Yeah, order, then you're pretty much hosed. Then. Yes, because it, I might be importing items that, that are listed as product name, description, price. And WP Commerce is then going to take the price and put it into additional description. So if it's out of order, it will be a big problem. Yeah, CSV is not going to have any kind of a key or anything. No, it will. Usually the first line of the CSV file does de delineate what the columns are. If it was exported properly, and usually they are in that format. At the very least, that CSV format is, is readable for you to be able to see what it looks like. I'm not used to CSV format coming out of Excel. If you set that, if you're working with Excel, could you change those, that first line to the column headings and you just kind of it? Yeah, that's what you'd usually have to do. A CSV file can be opened in Excel. So uh, taking that plain CSV file, opening Excel, massaging it the right way, saving it as CSV, not XLS, and then importing it into your database of e-commerce, that's the way to do it. Yeah, that's what I meant about massaging the, the data. You, you have to manually move those columns in Excel, save it as CSV, and then... What's that? It takes a little while. That's, what, uh, that's why God invented unpaid interns. <laughs> It might often be difficult to transfer data between e-commerce solutions, so you may want to try different ones before committing to the right one. That's why we'll cover both. Uh, next time we'll, we'll look at adding a few products here, how that works. Um, then we'll switch over to W. Then we'll switch over to WooCommerce. We'll see it's very similar, different interface, different pros and cons. 
I want to cover both of them. Then you'll decide. I I, I do uh, see people, not quite half and half, but I do see people deciding on one versus the other after we look at them. Because people often just say, oh, just go with WooCommerce. It is very powerful. It has a lot of features. You saw it had more star ratings. But perhaps depending on your product and your services and inventory, one might be better than the other. And one reason oftentimes that star ratings and such are low is because people are very quick to put a negative star review rating on something than a positive one. Have you ever done that? That you've you know put in a negative comment on something but forgot to do the positive one and you tell yourself, I'm going to do a good comment? I see that all the time. Um, managing people's Yelp accounts that people are so quick to put something negative they never do the positive so we'll get back to these other screens next time and we'll add a few products and see how it works general questions on what we talked about so far today on uh, on e-commerce and such okay so we're gonna end the main lecture at this point to have a little lab time your task uh, for practice is to make a backup of the site following the instruction number four. Uh, make a backup of the site, make an archive of the site. I'll put a copy of mine in the network folder in a moment and my notes. I have a little lab time for you to do that. When we come back next time, we'll continue learning a little bit more e-commerce.